Hey guys, how's it going? Rush here. I'm just having a go at playing, uh, playing on a bunch of different streams and just doing some study. Seeing if anyone's out there. So what I'm going to do very quickly is go into each stream and just see. Type something in one if it come back for me. If we go to Twitch, we're going to say testing. We're going to see if that comes back into. Go to mixer. Finally, go to live one. See what that. Oh, cool. so it's come from Twitch. Perfect. Streams. Test from Mixer. Stream. Test from Mixer. In my restream chat, but. Restream chat, but Harder to do than I thought. Harder to do than I thought. Harder to do. Start to be had. Optional.
Whoa. Control head off. And head use control A, select all. You can either use control C or right click, choose copy. Close out of this. And it shows that I'm connected to the three different services that I've restreamed to. You go in here in the options. And you want to select the embed to chat stream. The web server I don't believe is working anymore. But you go in here, you change your, however you want it to set up. Uh, message opacity background is of course the message opacity of these little blocks. Chat background opacity is the opacity around it and behind it. You can adjust the scale however you want, however long you want the messages to display for. Then you just go in here and I use control A, select all. You can either use control C or right click, choose copy. We'll close out of there, we'll minimize this. So you want to add a source as a browser source, so you do need the OBS browser source plugin. Name it whatever you want. This yeah, who cares what it really name name for for this testing process? <coughs> then you have to paste your URL here. And I find 200 by 400 works pretty good, but play around with it however you want to <coughs> the stream. Chat. And then you see we have this chat window. So I'm gonna leave it over here that way because this is my actual in the background is my. Let's show you here. Is that it? So the background is my mixer stream page. That is ready to display messages. For testing purposes, it'll work just fine. So we're going to type in test. And you notice here now it's displayed in the stream. So when your viewers, so your viewers will now be able to see that chat message oh, and man. what platform it will actually be under. Do the test, eh? So that's basically it. So Go if you're using Restream, it list. kind of behooves you to use the chat client because it'll display all the that'll chats all in one big, that'll window be instead of having to have three different uh, chat oh, windows that you're taking track from of. Twitch. It'll display an Rip icon showing which uh, streaming service they're from. So that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Twitch. Thank you. Oh, this is cool. Yeah. Smiley face. Oh, this is cool. It works. That's awesome. Right? Smiley face. Got that working. So let's come with what we have to do. It works. That's awesome. Right? Smiley face. So I can't. Got that working. So let's come with what we have to do. It works. That's awesome. Awesome. All right. Today we're going to knock out. Awesome. Fresh cards right. we go. It's the uh, prices. Oh, we got Echo. <clears throat> that is not nice. Fresh cards we go. Let's use that. Prices. Oh, there we go. Very good. So the way I like to study is, oh, is that going to type message after, let's see. Awesome. So the way I like to study Viper. Use that as guidance on how long to stay. Well, hey, Paparino, what's going on? Bad? Yeah. Coming to chill? Hello? So we look at an hour of study.
like I said, I think the best way is two timers. Pre set up before. In. A little bit of music. Here we are. Nice. If I knock out these flashcards, that would be very, very, very happy. Here are the topics I need to learn. I ideally get all those. I'm dude, be cool. I ask what is with the countdown. Countdown is the way I like to study, like using a, a Pomodoro style, where I focus on what I'm doing for 25 minutes, and then I have a five little five minute break, get up, take a walk around, stretch my legs, usually make coffee in that time. And then I come back and I do another 25 minutes, and I repeat that three, four times. I knock out maybe two hours of work, and then have a longer break, half an hour, an hour. So I actually just use this website, Tomato Timer. It does the whole thing for you. Pomodoro is like your work. This short break part is, is a five minute timer. And long break is like a 30 minute timer. You can adjust them if you want. And for me at any rate, it just really helps to like keep focused and keep on track. That makes sense yeah yeah for me that's i i've got a very short attention span so if i am reading some dense something dense something really boring and i look over at the timer and i know 
like, fuck, I've only got 15 minutes left. I can read for another 15 minutes. It kind of pushes me to keep on going. For me, that's that was one of the, the big things. It allows me to keep focused. And then I know, like, in five minutes, I can go to the toilet. I can have a drink, make a cup of coffee or whatever. It really helps. What about you, men? You got any good study tips? Anything that works well for you? You know, something that helps you keep your, your productivity up? I have the same problem. I have a squirrel brain. Yeah, tell me about it. Brutal, man. It can be absolutely brutal. Like, I, I, so many times I've read through, started reading through a chapter of a book that I'm trying to get through. <laughs> and then I just, I just lose it all. I just completely lose the plot with where I'm up to. Or you look back and you go, what did I just spend the last 10 minutes reading? Soundtracks, no words. Ah, oh, man, I'm all over that. Exactly what I've got here. In fact, this one's almost a bit too funky for me, though. This one's a little bit too groovy. This is a bit better. Reading out loud sometimes helps. Yeah, agree, agree. That's, in fact, why I sometimes study on here. I just think that it... If I'm like explaining things as I go, even if no one's watching, it just like I it kind of helps me to cement it in my brain a bit better. At the moment, I'm reading about emergencies that happen with anesthesia, and it is dense. <laughs> Put it blindly. My usual method of doing it is I read about it in a textbook. Then I create a small card that I want to that I want to learn. Teaching helps you understand. That makes sense. Perfect sense, actually. Yeah, man. I, I'm the way I got through uni. I studied with this bloke, and he learnt really well by being spoken to for some reason, and I went learnt very well by speaking too. So. I, uh, I used to learn something and I would teach it to him and it just was this very mutually beneficial relationship. But my general plan, I read a book, I make flashcards. Whether that's copying and pasting stuff or, or, or not, I make these nice little summaries. Then I convert them into a digital flashcard using Anki. And then that way I'm constantly uh, I'm able to test and retest myself. Oh. Uh, this is Ranger. Good boy. Hobby. Come on. You need something to distract you. I'm going to be back in a minute. I just need to give this. Or something. isn't he? He's too cute. He was looking at us with that, that cute little face when we got him from the rescue. Turned out he's an absolute rat bag. He was about a year old when we got him. Two and a half now. Like he, he had a pretty rough, pretty rough bringing is all they could tell us. 
had one owner who just got him as a puppy, thought he was cute, let him do whatever he want, learned a lot of bad habits, and then thought, oh, wow, he's too much work, I'm going to get rid of him. And then his neighbor said, no, 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 don't put him down, I'll take him. But this neighbor, unfortunately, had a little, little dog of his own, and him and Ranger here just did not get on. Been tough. Ranger. My hairy little baby. <laughs> My wife and I joke, but we don't joke that if that if it came down to it, we would pick him over each other. But I actually think it's that's a hundred percent serious that we pick him. Do you have any pets? Oh, kind is he? He's a uh, a staffy cross bull terrier. So he's very strong, very cheeky, very handsome as well. Hear him crunching. He's gone shy, he's embarrassed. Me and boy, our boyfriend say the same thing about our cats. <laughs> yes. You have two cats. Oh, nice, nice. I don't mind cats. Like, are they the sort of cat where they're just too aloof, too cool for everyone? Or do they actually come over to you? Because th that's what I love about dogs. You know, you, you have the worst day, just ever day at work or, or whatever, and you come home, no matter what, stoked to see you. No matter how shitty your day was. You might come home and you just want to lie on the couch and do nothing, but they look up at you and they just want to go out for all. It just makes everything better. <laughs> Are they huge snuggle bugs? Not cat like at all. Oh, that's good. They're the good ones. They're the good ones. Actually, what evolved? I've only had one cat. His name was Bob. The big, fat, black, fluffy thing. He just—he was too cool for everyone. On a bar of any. little demons oh no really <laughs> Bob how did you land on that well I was five <laughs> and my sisters were four and two so Bob seemed like a good name for a cat <laughs> and our dog at the time her name was Jessie Ranger here hmm. That's the name he came with. I don't think I'd ever call a dog Ranger. It's it's kind of reminds me of like uh, Scout or uh, you know those other like kind of names that you always hear for a dog in movies. I never would have called Ranger, but suits him. Oh, it makes perfect sense now. <laughs> yes, I can spell it. You know, at five years old, it was yeah, it seemed to work well. And that cat lived. I think he lived to like. 15? I'm trying, I'm trying to remember because we, we got him when we were living in one house and I would have been, yeah, five or six. And I swear, he, I, I'm sure he died when I was... Oh, it would have been 2000 and, 2010? He would have been, he would have been 50, like 14, 15 years old. And that, and that 
dog lived even longer. Dog lived till 2014, so she was probably almost like she would have been about 16 years old. Because I remember I had to with with the dog in particular. The cat was too cool for everyone, but the the dog she was she was adorable, Jesse. She um she was very smart. She was a German Shepherd Kelpie mix from that we got from the pound as well, and. I, my, uh, my well, wife, but girlfriend at the time, and I moved like interstate, and we came down for just a weekend or something back home. And my mum was like, "She's very sick. The dog is very sick. We should put it. She's she's pissing inside. She's too arthritic to get outside. We should put it. Fine thing to do." And so I flew down home for one weekend and ended up having to take my childhood dog to be put down. <laughs> Oh, poor thing. Oh, man. I I went with my dad and I we both cried like babies. Oh, I'm tearing up thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. But I think at that stage, it's it's the humane thing to do, isn't it? You know, with... Like, she was... Like, her kidneys were failing and, and she was on a bunch of painkillers and she was still, even with that, like, just couldn't get herself outside to go to the bathroom. I don't think. Like in the wild that like they would have died five years before that level. So she had a she had a very good innings, I think. And it was nice it was it was nice to be there with them. Like I was talking with the vet about it afterwards and they were great because you go in there, they and like they talk to you and tell you what's going on and they very very quick at putting in yeah, it'd be better than letting them suffer. Yeah, exactly. Um they were very good at like they they put the drip in, they gave them the medications and, and then they and they they pass away it's all very very quick and then they let you they leave you in the room with them for like as long as you want you can stay there for like you know an hour then you can take the dog you can take the body home or you can just or you can um let them uh do, handle the body and i thought that's really nice because then you don't have to you, you can do it either way if you want and they were telling me that some people just drop their dog off and they're like yep needs to be put down and then they leave Lag. Is it lagging, is it? Because you're on um on Mixer. I'm, I'm I usually just stream on Twitch, but I'm trying out this restream service to to go to a couple of different things at once. I don't know how to if if lags probably because of that, isn't it? Yeah. I just I just remember the lady at this thing saying that some people just drop their dogs off and they're just like yep put them down and then they just leave and they and the last thing in my mind the last thing that this poor dog that they claim to love you know has is here in this cold you know sterile uh, vet's office man that's terrible that's so bad Oh wow, we got got pretty deep this morning. Got a tear out of me. <laughs> Thinking about my poor puppy. Oh, I need to give this good boy a cuddle now. What's going on, huh? What's going on here? Couldn't handle watching it. Yeah, like I, I can, I can understand it, but think about these little guys. Think about these, what they're going through in there. Oh, you're burping, are ya? Got a good, got some good food. Huh? Gonna, gonna do it like this, are we? Like this, my hairy baby. Yes, we are. Even your dog looks Australian. 
He looks a lot like a kangaroo. Oh, yeah. You like that, Pete? Huh? Kangaroo, aren't you? High five to you. Good boy. Mwah. Get down and you having fun. so spoiled oh my god isn't he he sleeps on the bed with us like we when we got him we we set a little dog bed up in the garage and we're like okay so this is where he's gonna sleep we're not gonna let him sleep on the bed we're not gonna be those those dog parents <sighs> i couldn't sleep all night i was so worried about him and so then we let him sleep in our room we're like no 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 he has to sleep on the floor like you know down in the corner and he did and he did, and then one morning we look over, like two days in, see him looking up at us and we're like, okay, come up under the bed for cuddles, bud. He comes up and now he sleeps in our bed every night. <laughs> and he growls at us if we like take try to take up too much of his space. <laughs> yeah man, he's he rules the roost here. Rules the roost. Do some flashcards, eh? This is some pretty low tier study. Use of power boards and extension cords renders what safety feature ineffective? Uh, equipotential earthing. Right, yeah. You let your cat sleep on your bed? You've got to with cats, though. They're like, you know, tiny little things. They can do whatever they want. Him, on the other hand, this 30 kilo fat boy that's on a diet. It's 20 minutes? Nah, man. It's fun. I like, I like having a chat on here at the same time. Uh, he needs Bivilla Rudin. Just the... Uh, if I'm if I'm serious about studying and I'm and I'm gonna stream it as well because I like streaming it I um I have a little hang on check this out how's this for a high tier chat I put this on then I hide the chat so I can't see anything it's their bed yeah exactly it's not our bed it's their bed <coughs> Once they discovered fluffy blankets, they never left. Yeah, that's right. But to be fair, at least in our case, it's mutually beneficial because this boy is like a bloody heater. So he keeps us warm. Like, we don't have to use our electric blankets at all. Very nice. Procedures contraindicated for patients with stimulated MRI. Got something in your brain that's made of metal. You don't go near a giant mag. Sensitizing an obese patient. The train of four accelerometer reads 0 0.9. Could you dose succinothonium on ideal body weight or total body weight? Below total body versus ideal body weight. You can see, oh my. These questions I'm looking at are from an AE, um, they're from previous multi choice questions. Not just in it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's anything. But the, that question was talking about what other procedures can't they have? So I'm studying for my uh, anesthesia exam. Um, and all so the way that this exam works is there's there's four parts to it, and the first three parts are a a multi choice exam, a short answer thing, and then a um. A medical examination viva where they they bring you an actual patient you have to examine them and find out what does it got the the questions i'm doing at the moment here are from this fantastic resource called the black bank where people who sit the exam they they everyone like plans out what questions they're going to remember and so you know someone will go i'll remember question 31 and 32 and they to their best of their abilities 
as soon as they get out of the exam, write the question down and all the all the options for the answer, and then they submit them to this bank. And so some of these questions are worded really shitly, and that's because of because people just haven't done a good job remembering it. Uh, so I've got no idea that one. Because if you base, because you meant to, you meant to dose sucks on ideal body weight. Succinethonium is like a paralyzing medication. See, look, so there's the timer. <laughs> I did, I did three questions, you know, a question every ten minutes. That's not too bad. Then what I can do. I open this thing up and you go short break and then you start and then, and then I'll go and have a coffee or whatever during this time. It's fine. We'll... What we might do instead, just try and study until the dog decides it's time that he needs a walk. So look, I think it's C. E, okay. Similar onset, denser block. Recommended to use total body weight. Interesting. Okay. Someone's done some research here and they've pulled up some references that, that back up that statement. Okay, that's interesting. Onset time is the same. Maximum block was less. Obviously makes sense. The drug does less if you give less of it. Cool. That works. Hell yeah, man. That's right. So what do you do with yourself? Witty Zeus. Hey, buddy. How's it going? A beer's block. Minimum time to deflate the tourniquet after lignocaine 3 milligrams per kilo. I, th I think it's 20 minutes. Got it. How you doing today? A oh, beers block. A beers block is cool. So if you want to, um, if someone's, say, broken their wrist, right, uh, you need to put it back into place you need to, because it helps with pain and, you know, uh, it, sometimes that can actually be enough and you don't even need to have surgery on it. So what you can do is what's called a beers block where you pop a tourniquet on someone's arm and you pop a, a needle in their hand, a cannula, and you put local anesthetic in there and it goes all through the blood vessels in that arm, but it doesn't go into the rest of the body because local anesthetic can be can cause seizures, it can cause uh, heart arrhythmias, all kinds of problems. And you, you put this tourniquet on so it just stays in the arm and pulls around and it numbs the whole arm and then you can do like really painful stuff to it. And it doesn't, and, and yeah, it, it gets rid of a lot of the pain. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I've um, I've I've had a little cry this morning. We were talking about my some of my old pets, and it was <laughs> a little bit emotional. Oh yeah. <laughs> cool. A little medical joke there for you. Beers, not beers block. Yeah, turn the key on. Give anaesthetic. Yeah, very nice. Homemaker and I work with a 3D printing company. Testing printable kits stuff. Wow, that sounds terrifying. Well, that's you know, if you if you if you break your wrist, you know that's what you're gonna get. Just boring stuff. Hell no, man. Hell no. I've um I've been eyeing off some three D printers for a while. I've I love gadgets and gizmos. Like I've got a couple of Raspberry Pi uh, pies, and I've been looking at some three uh, D printers. Just just basic ones. But oh, I would just make the most stupid shit. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is an interesting one. Stabbing injury to the lateral half of the spinal cord. What are the three classical signs? Three. What are the classical signs? Three segments below the leaf. Lateral loss of light touch sensation. Oh shit. Okay. Um. Oh. Uh, pretty sure this is the. It's called Brown Saccard syndrome. Uh, 
I've got nothing. I'm drawing blanks. And I've already, yeah, it's looked brown Saccard Syndrome. I knew that bit. I got that bit. I won one million dollars last night at the casino. No joke. All right, I've got some questions. Let me ask you this. Which casino? What were you playing? And what's the first thing you're going to do with it? Million dollars. What would I do with a million dollars? I'd probably pay off my home loan. Be my first thing. I reckon. Yeah, I'd knock. I'd knock that out. Uh, and then you'd have to go on a holiday, don't you? You have to go on a holiday. You'd have to. Um, you'd have to pay some money, you know, to friends and family. I'd have to give my parents some some money. They've always been, you know, really good to me. So I'd have to. I'd have to give them something. What about, what about you guys? What would you do with a million dollars? My boyfriend is obsessed with 3D printers and computers. Yeah? Oh, man. My, I, it's, it's fun. It's fun, like, doing things like that with your hands. You know? I reckon, I reckon it's great fun. My uh, most recent thing I've done with um, these Raspberry Pis, I built a... Uh, what do you call it? Like a, like a game arcade cabinet. So, like, you know, you can play Mario and all these old school things. Invest, generate interest. Oh, see, that's too logical. That's too logical. I reckon you should just double down, put it on the dollar slot machine. On a dollar slot machine? Hell yeah, man. That's awesome. How much money did you spend to get that million, though? That's that's my question. Invest and generate interest. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. That's probably the smart thing to do, isn't it? Put in a bank. But it's not very exciting. You know, it doesn't get your blood pumping, does it? Ooh, I'm making compound interest. <laughs> Come on, all right. So, so that's that's what you'd really do. But what what would you do if you couldn't do that? Like, what would what would you buy? What I'd buy? I need a new car. I've got at the moment. I'm driving like an old crappy station wagon a subaru forest oh it's not it's not that crap but you know with old fat boy back here around 500 dollars that's a you know, that's a good good return on investment but jesus what if you didn't win the million dollars man a lot of money lucky very lucky that said i'd rather be lucky than good as the saying goes all right what did it say here be ipsilateral touch light touch the station contralateral loss of Sensei. Okay, so light touch goes all the way up and crosses in the brain. No, it crosses at the level. Read up on that. Let's put that. Let's bury that card. I'll suspend that card and we'll come. House, nice little car. A cat. A cat wall. It's a cat wall. I did, I did cry, be all mad. What? You, you cried as well? Oh, that's so, that's, that's amazing. What are you doing on here, man? You should be out like, you should be out partying. One million dollars, wowee. That's phenomenal. Here we go. Worst greenhouse gas effect. Alternative. Volatile with the greatest global warming potential. Uh, it's either desflurane or nitrous oxide. So all these are gases that you use in anesthesia. Like shells and things to jump on and scratch. Oh, I see. I get you. I get you. No friends. Dude, you got a million dollars. That's a million friends right there. All these gases you use to keep people asleep under anesthesia. And all of them are devastatingly bad. You, you reckon nitrous? Alright. I think it's nitrous too. No, 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 we're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a statistic for you for how bad these gases are, these anesthetic drugs. Um, all uh, global... Of all the emissions that the world creates that contributes to the greenhouse gases and their effect, 
anesthetic gases is like 2% of them. And so, I mean, I'm talking about like all of the cars on the road in the world, all uh, all farming, you know, with, with cows that produce methane and, and so everything, coal plants, oil, everything. Out of all of that, these gases are so devastatingly bad for the atmosphere, they contribute 2%. Which I mean, that, like, doesn't sound like much, but like, honestly, how how much of these get secreted into the atmosphere? Not much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does it like. But when you think about how little of a how little of an uh, like volume wise these gases go into the atmosphere, it they're just devastatingly bad. In fact, like I know I know some anaesthetists that are actually changing how they give their um, anaesthetics because of this. Yeah, 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 you get it, you get it. Yeah, like some some guys are changing, because these are, all these are like, they're liquids, but they turn into a gas, and then you breathe them in and out, and you keep a patient asleep that way. But some people now are changing over to using TIVA, Total Intravenous Anesthesia, T-I-V-A. And by doing it that way, you don't have any of these gases like there's a lot of a lot of plastic that goes to waste there's a lot of glass you know i'm sure this stuff isn't good for the oceans when it gets put down the sink which is where it ends up um but are you not warming the planet up did you seriously win a million dollars i don't I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. That's amazing. Difficult thyroidectomy with respiratory distress and stridor. So they've, so they've taken someone's thyroid out of their neck, and they've pulled the breathing tube out, and they immediately struggle to breathe. And stridor is like, it's a sound of upper airway obstruction. So they're going like, <gasps> making that kind of noise. <clears throat> so something that can happen during thyroid surgery. Uh, you've got nerves that go from your brain called cranial nerves and they, they go down into your organs and control things. And you've got one of them's called the, uh, the it's the vagus nerve, but there's part of it called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that actually goes down and then it loops back up into the throat and it controls your vocal cords. And when you take someone's thyroid out, these can get cut. So... RLN is recurrent laryngeal nerve, so I reckon this person's got a recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy because all these other ones, bleeding, they you know takes a bit longer. Edema takes a little bit longer. Hypocalcemia, fuck off, that's nothing. Recurrent laryngeal nerve palsies. Go come at me, exam. The perioperative hemodynamic stability. A patient with carcinoid should be treated with. Okay, so they've only remembered one answer for this question. <coughs> oh, creatide. I don't know anything. Metastatin analog, carcinoid tube, somatostatin receptors. Binding to these receptors, bioactive amines. Cool. <laughs> Not something I would have come to myself, but doing these questions. That one again. All right, so we said here, this is a repeat question. When anesthetize someone who's obese, if you dose it on ideal versus total body weight, you will see a similar speed of onset, but a longer recovery. E. Good, good. Ah, uh, creatide, we said that desflurane is the worst gas. Seen that question. Hell yeah, finish that deck. Go team. Management of intraoperative anaphylaxis. All right, so you've someone's asleep, given them a their antibiotic or whatever, and then all of a sudden they start to they start to swell up and try to die. Hey, this has been a blast, but I need to go. Good luck in your studies. Oh, you, thanks, man. Thanks for following. I actually think you're my first follower on Mixer. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for hanging out. 
I think I might try and stream on, keep on streaming on here too. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Maybe, maybe your um, boyfriend could give me a recommendation or, or yourself for a 3D printer that I could get to just play around with at home. Recognize, remove the trigger, give them fluids, give them adrenaline. Easy. Yeah, I think you are. Hang on, let's have a look. Have a little. You know, it'd help if I knew how to read this. <laughs> One followers. You're the first follower. Hi, I'm Bunny. Nice to meet you, Bunny. <laughs> I'm Dr. Crush. Oh, you're back. You're back. Back right. Up there. Oh, we're on Mixer, how about that? Oh. Well, you know what? I actually think I probably need to go as well because this young man... This young man is about to have a stroke. Oh! You've been very good. Oh. Oh. Old friend, I helped out by giving her. Spent it on her boyfriend. I heard from. Ah, oh, dude, sucks. Went out and happens. I guess once you put it out there, though, like it's. If, if, if that's what someone wants to do with their money, that's their call. Cool. Uh, like, like, my parents help my one of my younger sisters out with money and she spends it on cigarettes. Well, that's not what they wanted money to go towards. Oh, you want a tug of war, do you? You're feeling strong. Strong boy. Oh. Let me just finish off these few cards, sir. Promise. My pinky promise.
chunkier in here. Outline the crisis management of a postpartum hemorrhage. To recognize it, you need to rub that uterus up. This is when a woman has a bleed. They've, um, after they've delivered their baby. And it, it can be life-threatening. Pregnant women bleed like stink. Where does that expression come from? Bleed like stink. I've heard it so many times. What does bleed like stink mean? Gonna bleed like stink. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, Hello Medicals Bleed Like Stink. Blah, 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 blah. From the Oxford English Dictionary, like stink is a pretty generic modifier. Tensely or furiously. In other words, it's an expletive. If I see a snake, I'm going to run like stink. The phrase mad as stink came to be an alternative for saying mad as hell in Old English. Somewhere along the way, instead of saying bleed like hell or bleeding intensely, bleed like stink came to be. Huh, there you go. How about that? Interesting. Learn something. Well, pregnant women bleed like stink. So, do give recognize? Get the surgeon to do something about it, rub up the uterus, but put the pressure. What's wrong, puppy? You okay? Give fluid. For every liter of blood lost, you need to give three to five liters of crystalloid. IV fluids. Oxytocics are the next line then too, so you need to give oxytocin. So an oxytocic is a drug that contracts the uterus. Oxytocin, five to ten units in the infusion following. Uh, ergometric would be next line, 500 mics. What have I missed? Oh, and the usual blood product. Crystalloid, rub the uterus up, blood products. Consider giving it a takeover. Give them a jet aesthetic if you need control of the situation. It makes sense. Describe how airway pressure change is going on to one lung ventilation and what an excessive or lack of airway pressure change may mean. So, one lung ventilation. When you have a patient, <coughs> when you have a patient and they need, surgeons need to operate on one side of the chest, you go onto what's called one lung ventilation. What you should see is a rise in airway pressure of about 30 to 40 percent. That's just because all the air is going to one lung while the other lung's not receiving any. And that's normal. If there's too much airway pressure change, you should see a. Um, what you need to do is check your equipment and make sure that you're actually in where you are and, th and you aren't just blowing air up against the side of the, the lung wall. If there's a lack of airway pressure change, it means you're probably not going onto two lung ventilation, onto one lung ventilation. So you need to check where you are. Normally rise by 30, 40%. Airway pressure rise. Excess. 
mechanical kinks, adjust the ventilation. Oh yeah, easy man. Annular cricothyroidotomy, so this is an emergency surgical airway. Do that by standing on the left hand side of the patient. One hand, you identify the cricothyroid membrane. So you do this if you're unable to pop a tube. And on one side of the patient like this. I'll turn it down lower in my headset. You put your hands on their neck like so. Finding them thyroid membrane, take a, a 16 gauge, 16? No, I think we use 14 gauge cannulas with a small, with a five mil syringe, a little bit of saline in it. As you go uh, advance that needle in, you aspirate and eventually you hit the trachea. You should suck in a whole bunch of air. Then you slide the cannula off and recheck that you're in the right position. Then you start jet ventilating. Right, I have no other co worker did the same thing. Spent on her kids. She asked me for $500 because she was broke and couldn't buy a Christmas presents this year. I felt sorry for her. She told me I will pay you back when I get a job. Never did pay me back. I called, but she didn't answer her phone. <laughs> Dude, I'm so sorry to hear that. I see why a lot of people, when they get money, they just don't tell anyone. You know, like, you're very, it's a good way of learning who you've real. Check this out. And I just want to respond to Min's excellent short video about I haven't got piped oxygen in my lab to do the actual oxygenation. I'm going to use this 15 mil connector that comes with a bronchial blocker onto an ambu bag just to simulate. In terms of the technique, I've got my 14 gauge angiocath and I've got my syringe, which is basic equipment that I need. I'm going to remove the filter off the back of the angiocath, connect that to the syringe. I like to use the needle in a bevel down orientation. Only do the you syringeal handshake as so nice described what? by Leverton. Feel for the cartridges in the midline, identify the cricothyroid membrane. I'm going to go through the cricothyroid membrane, feel for the pop. When I'm in the trachea, keeping everything nice and stabilized. Aspirate air, advance off my cannula, make the needle safe. Again, aspirate air to confirm I'm still in the trachea, and then connect my ventilation, and I'm good to go. You can't ventilate through it like that. Like, what he just did then is stupid. Like you might be able to, you, you need to jet ventilate, like you need a high pressure oxygen source. Like squeezing air in it like that, it's just not enough. Like you're not going to, you're not going to adequately oxygenate the patient. <coughs> you high pressure jet. Disagree. I disagree with that, man. You're in trauma hemorrhage, so... If someone's bleeding intraoperatively, you need to recognize it. You need to make sure the surgeons are doing something about it. Two big IVs, 14 or 16 gauge, so you can pour fluid in. You give crystalloid and very early blood products. You need to warm the patient, warm the theater, give warm fluids, because if patients are cold, they don't, their blood doesn't clot and bleeding just gets worse. And you get into this, this spiral of doom if, that's, if you end up in a situation like that. Uh, where were we? Um, so you give fluid, but you, there's a concept of um, of permissive hypotension. So you don't want to give them drugs to bring their blood pressure up, like betaraminol or noradrenaline or whatever, because if you bring up it up too much, they're just going to bleed more. Right. So you let them sit at like a low, uh, like a permissively low blood pressure, where they're still going to perfuse their vital organs, while the surgeons get control, and then. Uh, carry on. Apology, uh, large IV. Use vasopressors only as necessary. Warm the fluids, warm the... Uh. 
so blood pro antifibrinolytic agents i didn't mention that. so that's like they're drugs that stop the breakdown of clots so like tranexamic acid heart line urinary catheter so full monitoring okay immediate management of maternal collapse so if, if a mum collapses there's a few reasons why common things are vasovagal local anesthetic toxicity um could be a bleed rest less commonly is something like anaphylaxis uterine rupture um uh, if they're having like a pro uh, like a amniotic fluid embolism a pulmonary embolism like a blood clot or, or amniotic clot to the lungs they've had a heart attack or a or some or a stroke or some intracranial event so what do you do just your normal normal things that st john's ambulance taught you abc's airway breathing circulation you just need to make sure uh that you pull put traction on the uterus and get baby off of those big blood vessels in mum's back when they're lying on the floor and if you don't get anything back from mum within four the first four to five minutes that's when you need to do a uh, perimortem caesar and get baby out no matter how no matter what gestation babies at you do that because you're trying to save mum with a baby after four IV access monitoring cardiac arrest protocol reversible causes here we go common causes vasovagal I said local anesthetic I didn't say bleed I didn't say hypertensive I didn't say high block okay need to remember Doctor disrespect the shit I'm watching. <coughs> Excuse me. Total spinal. Um, a total spinal is like when when you give someone a regional anesthetic. Oh, thanks, thanks, Wee Zeus. Thanks, thanks for the follow. You're the second person following me on Mixer. I hope all this stuff works out for you, dude. It sounds really complicated and messy. And I don't have any advice for you. I guess just don't... It sounds like these you've, you've had the... You've been fleeced a couple of times by these people that you thought were friends, but... Tough man. Be tough. Mm. Hope you have a pen. Outline the emergency management of a total spinal, obstetric and non obstetric. So, a, a total that they're talking about is a spinal anesthetic, where if you give someone um, Uh, an injection in the back to to numb them up for surgery it can go too high and so if it goes up up into the th higher thoracic region they're going to start getting uh effects on their blood pressure heart rate if it goes too high it can affect your your uh diaphragm and your ability to, to breathe so what you need to do is quickly figure out how high it's going reassurance to the patient Monitoring their blood pressure, treating it with metaraminol or ephedrine or something like that. Treating heart rate with atropine, your um, vagolytic drugs. IV fluids. If it's going too high and you're actually starting to get breathing compromised, then you probably need to induce the patient and take over their... and oxygen presses lift the legs IV fluid yep meant CPR yep okay so ALS ALS is always there thanks bro you're welcome dude you're welcome sounds it sounds and you know more, more money more problems <laughs> as, <laughs> as a very wise man once said differential oh we just did this okay so differential when mum collapses 
<coughs> I'm just getting over the man flu. So, differential for when mum collapses. It's the music. Morning. There it is. We know that you want to hear my voice. Common things. Vasovagal, local anesthetic toxicity, high spinal neuraxial block, um, bleeding. Almost common things, probably. Uncommon, amniotic fluid embolus, pulmonary embolus, cardiac event, uterine rupture or, or abruption, um, intracranial event. They're my top top picks. Let's see. Hypertensive disease of pregnancy. They're talking about preeclampsia there. Anaphylaxis is the other uncommon one. So I was close. I got a I got a couple of them. Could have been better, but I got close. What solution do you use for an eye block? Alright, do you want to see something fucked up? You want to see something messed up. It's gonna ruin your life. So if you have cataract surgery, you don't get a general anesthetic. It's one is antidepressants, and the other one is a pre-diabetic pill. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah, definitely keep taking those. Yeah, yeah. Diabetic pills like metformin or something. Yeah, good on you. So many people, especially with antidepressants, they don't want to, like, take something because some people have this perception of... of um, you, know, you should just be able to get on with it, but I think that so many more people need to be on those medications than, than actually do take them, you know? All right, so let's talk, about, let's talk about what happens if you come in to have a cataract surgery done. So if you come in for a cataract, you, don't, you oftentimes don't get a general anesthetic. You might get something that makes you not remember the case, what happened, but you don't actually oftentimes have, the, have uh, a general anesthetic where you're fully asleep. Instead, you get, uh, they just numb the eye itself. And the most common way they do that is with what's called a subtenons block. Right. If you're squeamish, this probably isn't a good one to watch. Squeamish, this is under what? All right, so. So, come in for your cataract surgery. Don't get a general anesthetic. You do this. Right. So, what you need to do is numb these nerves the back of the eye here. So this is this is the globe. This is the optic nerve that carries your pathway of sight. What you need to do is get local anesthetic back here near this nerve. What you used to do back in the day is you would pass a needle, a long needle. Oops. You would you would pass a long needle through under the eyeball and you would inject local anesthetic right back here. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Possibility of going blind. What we do now is you actually cut the eyeball and you put local anesthetic back here where this number seven is.
See? You inject behind the eyeball like this. This is all on YouTube, so you can just you can go and watch this yourself. You don't believe me? That's right. So this is the safest way of doing this anesthetic. That's right, Dr. Olive. We're just gonna use these forceps to pick up the patient's skin of the eye, the sclera. These are Westcott scissors. You use those to snip the eye. I don't actually use these when I do it. I've I've had better luck using um using a flexible cannula. So you start off by cleaning the eye. You need to put some in the eye. So see how the pupil is really big and black? They've uh, actually put some um, eye drops in to numb the eye as well as cause dilation for the surgery when they have the cataract removed. So this is iodine, so they're just getting rid of any bugs, bacteria. So they're drawing up some sterile medication right now. That's the local anesthetic. All right, if you're squeamish, this is where you don't want to watch. Talking about logistics, first of all, you need to put a speculum in the eye. This can actually sometimes be the hardest bit. So you get that in the eye, and then you need the patient to look upwards and outwards. So what you do is you go in the lower, the infranasal quadrant. You go here, right? They look up and out. You need to pick up a little bit of the sclera, this white part of the eye here. Get on with it, mate, this poor person. You look, they're looking up and out. You pick up a little bit of the eyelid there. Jesus Christ, he's taking so long. This poor patient. This poor patient. Pick up a little bit of it. Can't really see. So he's making a little cut in the eye. Then you use these scissors to push down and create a small tract around the eyeball itself. See the whites of the eye. <laughs> you just you just push them down there. You just get them round the back. Balls deep. Dog needs to go. Yeah, he does. It's because we've got some dogs next door that are barking. Now you put the cannula in, the local anesthetic. Inject that behind the eye. And you'll see some of it coming out. That's fine. The most of it's getting behind the eye. See how the, uh, the conjunctiva is sort of like puffing out a little bit? There we go. Now you could, the way you tell it's a good block, you see how the eye is not moving? We call that akinetic. And even the lid, like they, a patient, once this is done, they can't open their eye by themselves. So this person now, they can't see out of that eye. It's lost vision from the local anesthetic. And they can't move it. So it's perfect for surgery. You go another one. Two for one. Two for one deal. What do you think, guys?
going to go get eye surgery now. So how do we get on that tangent? Oh, yes, we're talking about what solution do you use for eye blocks? I use lignocaine and ropivacaine. I use get my syringe, four mils of 0.75% ropivacaine, one mil of a uh, of um sorry, four mils of jeez, I've forgotten what I, my mix is. Yeah, ten percent, one mil of ten percent, because then you get two percent. 0.6%. Perfect. Good mix. Immediate management. ABCs. Pull the uterus across. Lots of fluids. Get monitoring on. Deliver baby within four minutes. Perfect. Four mils of 0.75 to make 0.6% ropivacaine. And then you use one mil of 10% lignocaine to make 2% lignocaine. Simple. Simples. No thanks, I'd rather go blind. Well, most of the people, like most of the times when you get cataracts, most of the times when you get your cataracts done, it's because you are starting to go blind. But, like I said, even though watching it, it's fucking horrific. You often get some get uh, a little bit of medication that makes you feel dopey, like you've had about a carton of beer, and it actually isn't painful. As crazy as that sounds, it doesn't hurt. There's a, a very small sting when the injection's first done. But I think the worst bit is just the thought of it. The most commonly reported cause of awareness during general anesthesia for a non-obstetric procedure. Equipment failure, human error, lack of premedication, recreational drug use, use of TIVA. Human error, I think. Yeah, human error. You'd rather go blind. You know what? I think, I, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm very squeamish when it comes to things like that. Which is a bit ironic, given what I do. I'm like, oh, hell no. Nah. <laughs> it's, um... It's it's funny though because because when you go in for it, you they put all these drops in the eye and it causes your pupil to to dilate, so you can't actually see much going on either. You've got very poor vision on top of your, you know, poor vision being the reason you've come. I'm snotty. All of these statements about naloxone is correct apart from. So naloxone is a drug that you give as an antidote to opioids. So if someone's had a heroin overdose, you give them naloxone or Narcan as it's Naloxone is a partial agonist. That is not true. Oh, each of these is true. Okay, so it's B. Naloxone is a complete. It is a. It is a full antagonist. Effective at mu opioid receptors. Yes. Side effects are rare. Elimination half time is approximately sixty minutes. Yes, that is true. Because naloxone, if you give it as an antidote to these other drugs, it wears off quickly. Uh, much quicker than sometimes these other drugs do. So people who have an overdose, they need to come into hospital again because the antidote will wear off first before the actual drug does. 
so you know they'll wake up and they'll be good and then want to leave but then if you if they do the same thing will happen again be false your antagonist Features of anorexia nervosa include each of the following except mitral valve prolapse. How does that happen? So anorexia nervosa, so that's anorexia where you just don't eat much. But it's not bulimia. So I don't think I, dental caries is like, it could be dental caries because maybe these people aren't, um, it, like it's, it's just related to a vitamin deficiency. Superficial parotitis, so swelling of your parotid glands. It's more of a alcohol, alcohol-related thing. But you know what? It probably could be related to anorexia nervosa as a vitamin deficiency. Hey, beautiful. Hey, you beautiful. What's going on? Oh my god! So Google on my phone heard me say "Hey, beautiful" and thought that I was talking to it. <laughs> If I go totally blind, my seeing eye dog better be able <laughs> to see. Uh, or we're bumping into a closed door or a glass wall. Yep, yep. <laughs> I think they're pretty. I think they're meant to be pretty you know, on point. Thanks, cutie. You're welcome. You're welcome, sweetie. <laughs> right, what do we got? I, I don't see how mitral valve prolapse could happen. Sinus bratty, yeah, I guess. You're not eating. Your metabolic rate goes down. Increased gastric emptying, yeah, because the body's trying to get rid of stuff. Look, I think it's, I think it's mitral valve prolapse. I was wrong. Okay. False, and the answer to choose. Gastric emptying is delayed. Hmm, huh. okay, so let's put that down as again. <laughs> nice haircut. <laughs> what hair? <laughs> Your head looks like an egg. I got I got called a potato the other day. Um, I had all the I had the lights off behind me, and like my face was really brightly lit. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? I've been going um I've been going shorter and shorter because it's just getting bit on top, and I I haven't pulled the trigger and shaved it all off yet. I've just like I'm just doing clippers with just the um with no guard on it anymore. It's good though because like the clippers cost me hundred bucks. But I haven't bought a, I haven't paid for a haircut. Started shaving my head before I started going bald, and it would have been when I was. Um, I shaved my head at seventeen. Your head looks like my shaved nutsack. <laughs> Man, you, you've got a, a full nutsack then. <laughs> you just reminded me of that scene from Deadpool with um. Wait, what does he call him? He says, your head looks like a shaved testicle. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, um, so I used to have long hair in high school. It used to be like down to here, you know, being a, a muso and all that. Hey, puppy, what's going on? And uh, then I shaved it when I was 17. And then I started, I started getting thin on the top of the back there when I was, um, jeez, oh, early 20s. Must have been like 2022, 20, I started getting a bit thin. And since then, man, it's, it's just been going downhill. Just getting shorter and shorter each time. But you know how it is. You know how it is. That's life, I guess. Worst things could happen. Your nuts could look like my head. All right. Let's carry on then, hey? Hey, puppy. All right, I'll finish this deck and then... Oh, okay. Finish this deck and then... Wait. The elderly patient. Sedation does not negate the, the benefits of regional anesthesia with respect to... Clearance of succinomethonium is reduced. Shivering may be less effective in restoring body temperature than young adults. Vasopressin and ANP are similar to those in younger. The uptake of SIBO is similar to that in adults because it's low blood solubility. 
I think it's shivering is less effective. Shivering is less effective. Yep. We've said here it is a uh, gastric emptying. They actually have slowed gastric. I don't know a whole lot about anorexia. That's actually it's your body up being really bad. So let's look up BJA education. CC. This one. What about anorexia? Perioperative implications of anorexia. Here we go. Here we go. Getting some knowledge, yo. Knowledge bombs. Anorexia nervosa may affect any physiological system. Electrical disturbance. All patients should be anesthetized as though they have a full stomach. Right, there it is. There. Body regulation, yep. They're thin, so positioning's important. Look, let's just let's just quickly do this as a thing about anorexia, hey? We'll make a quick little flashcard. This is this is how I do it. Electrolyte disturbance. Uh, low. Have I got an unfasted one? Make a link. else in carefully position and keep warm considerations let's go of the and is there a nice little definition like what is what Rex you know just deliberately withholding oral in psychiatric disorder lifetime risk strict psychologically driven weight loss with pain by restricting may be augmented by over exercise and purging it sucks me what an awful condition to have there are two broad types of anorexia there is restricting type and there is uh Characterized by profound reduction in caloric, then they exercise excess. Then binge eating, purging type, right? So they eat and vomit. Eat. Criteria, so they've got a tiny BMI. Weight loss is self-induced, right? So it's not just people that have, that have been starved. Uh, body image is distorted, so they think... They're fat, or they um, or they feel that being fat is the worst. There is endocrine dysfunction. Okay. What are these different slimming pills? Guarana. This is this is what I'm on, man. I love this. This is my favorite.
Love me some caffeine. How do they get mitral valve prolapse? That's what I, I don't. Echocardiography shows a higher incidence of mitral valve prolapse. It's not clear. It's postulated that a loss of LV volume and mass leads to abnormal mitral valve. Whoa. It's insane. Wow, <laughs> All right, cool. Done. save this <clears throat> summary of all the different systems effect nice and we go to here Flash cards, add a card, uh, put that there, outline the perioperative considerations with anorexia nervosa, like card yeah nice cheeky I'm just gonna go to the bathroom
dental caries. What do we say? So causes uh load gets tricky with these guys and Esper. Human error, we said. Block transversus. position you will deposit the local anesthetic beneath the peritoneum fuck no into the transverse abdominuses fuck no between the transversus abdominus and internal obliques yes yes i believe that's it i believe that's where it goes have any evidence of that am i gonna click it yes D. Sorry, C. Get on. Okay. I think Doggo's being a good dog. Be able to keep on going. Let's do it. Mission one. What is the Apache 2 score? Fuck. Apache 2 is a scoring system used in intensive care to predict mortality. Um, but it's kind of evolved beyond that. I, th I thought it was like a scoring system to predict mortality after discharge from ICU. Severity of disease score classification. Yeah, I wouldn't have got it. What is standard deviation? Okay, any, any statisticians in the room? Standard deviation is a, it's a value to describe the distribution of a population around the mean. What to be expressing by how much the members of a group differ from the mean value? That's pretty close. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. ISS, what is, what is ISS? International Space Station. Injury severity score. It's established member of trauma severity that correlates with morbidity, mortality, and stay in hospital. Major trauma is more than... I've never heard of this before. I don't deal with much trauma, though, so that's probably why. Head and neck. <coughs> right, so you look at each region of the body and then you look at severity of the score. Okay, if you brushed someone's head that would be a six. Untreatable. I get it. Duke activity status index. So this is like looking at someone's function, like how functional they are during the day. Oh, with relation to cardiac disease. Right, right. A rough estimate of someone. Stairs. And you'll have sexual relations. This is part of every assessment I ask a person. I go, can you do heavy work around the house, such as scrubbing floors? Can you do yard work like raking leaves? 
do you have sexual relations? They look at me and they're like, Doctor, why did you ask me that? I go, I'm curious. So the EE ratio is a measure of the heart's ability to relax. Measure of LV diastolic distance. Brain death testing. You look for general reactivity to painful stimulus, and then you check each cranial nerve. Number two separate positions. Coma. Are they in a coma? Noxious stimuli everywhere? They need to be a GTS3. Then you do brainstem reflexes. One and two, three. Now, obviously. Five and seven by trying to see link. Once. Uh, right. Cause pain on the face. And you're looking for a response to that. Stibular ocular reflex. So this is where you, this is a weird test. I've never actually seen this one. I haven't seen many like brain death testings. So what you do, put cold water in the ear. You need to be able to see the eardrum and you flush cold water into it and you look for nystagmus. So the eyes flicking. Gag reflex, off reflex, apnea. So you stop breathing for them and see what happens. Right, and you hang on, so you do apneas with CO2 and oxygen. ISS, we've just learnt. Injury severity score, you look at different parts of the body and then you score them on a 1 to 6 based on um, severity of the injury. And if it's more than 15, they're, uh, they're a major trauma. Face, oh, head and neck. Okay, head and neck, face. Chest, abdomen, extremities, skin. Okay, so a burn, a burn would see ah oh, cool, okay. Kinda makes sense. And you can use it to like classify how injured someone is with. Oral hypoglycemics, okay. So Bigonides like metformin, soft on your ears. Uh there are the glitter zones. Uh this is when I start to get funky. Bones. I can't remember any others. <laughs> Bigonides. There's the glitter zones. Soft on your ears. I said. Ah, secretagogues and acarbos. So I, those two are those two are weird. Maybe I will buy me a new car. Hell yeah, man! What sort of car are you thinking? Although maybe buying a house could be, you know, could you even can you even buy a house for a million dollars anymore? Classification of pulmonary hypertension. So there's five types. Type one is idiopathic; it just happens. Type two is related to left heart dysfunction. Type three is hypoxemic. Type 4 is thromboembolic, and type 5 is like a multifactor. Hell yeah! I fucking got it! Dude, super stoked! I got that! Asbled, so this is a, a scoring system looking at someone's risk factor. Is it for bleeding when they're on warfarin? Predicts major risk risk of major bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation. So when someone so atrial fibrillation is is when the atria, the small chambers of the heart, don't contract properly and they they fibrillate. So they're at risk of um of getting blood clots from that. I oh, read because you can't take a house with you. Yeah, yeah. And I finally settled down. We bought this place. Town house thing. Unit townhouse. It's nice buying though, because you can just do stuff. So like I've um, you know, like these blinds up here, stuck those there. Um, and 
Let's see. Over on the bottom of this bookcase, that's where the uh, net port part of the room. Done. I've run the Ethernet cable up the cupboard along the along the top. I haven't I haven't done a good job of it yet. Finished um, because when I was trying to cut the Ethernet, create the end of the core properly. I put a plug up there, the one that's running on the outside of the wall doesn't have, um, it didn't work and I just, I just, again, so it's nice being able to do things in your own house. You don't have to talk to a landlord about putting a picture up. All right, so has bled. Has bled. Let's look this up. Geez, that looks like a scene out of Saw, doesn't it? That guy's eyeball. Bled is a scoring system. Assess the one year risk of major bleeding in patients on anticoagulants. I thought they had to be on anticoagulants. The predictive value is the likelihood that a test that gives you a positive result, a truly positive result. Certainty with which a test, a positive test result, it's a positive. Not really what I said, is it? All right, so the ACS NS Quip, the American College of Surgeons, uh, something surgical quality improvement. I can't remember the name, but it's a list of like 25 different patient factors as well as the surgery they're having. And it gives you like risk of anything, risk of mortality, risk of every problem. American College, American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. Okay. 20 different predictors. Really good. You can just, I use this a lot whenever I see sick patients. Tell them what their true risk of this surgery are. National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards. Okay, so this, this is shit. <laughs> but it's, yeah, I guess it's important. So it's talking about communication, right patient, right procedure, right bloods, right medications, minimizing falls, um, bullying and harassment, governance, humors, infections, right medication, right procedure, clinical blood product. I didn't say pressure injuries. I said falls. I did, so this is met calls. I missed met calls, pressure injuries, Infections, consumers. Okay, I, I just missed half. That's not too. Bad. Just missed half. Indications for an aortic valve replacement. Are kind of interesting. So, you need to get your valve replaced if. Tough one.
know if I know the answer to it. I might up stumps there, hey? Thanks very much, guys, for hanging out. Um, stream there. Might come back, play a little bit of games later on, I reckon. What do you reckon? Sound good? Cool. Thanks for hanging out. See you next time.